All right, you know it's serious when our uh, graphic has a fountain pen on it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's time for contract negotiations. That's all the talk in the NFL. I get people tweet me, Jeremy. They're like, can you guys stop talking about that? I get it, but, like, that's what's going on. So, <laughs> we do have some important things to get to in Contract Corner with Jeremy Fowler. Take us through some of the most notable names that we're still trying to figure out whether or not they're yeah. going to sign a deal. Let's begin in Miami with yeah. quarterback Tua Tagovailoa. Boy, that fancy pen needs more use. He's got yeah, I know. a contract. Dried up. Tua Tagovailoa. So, he's been talking with the Dolphins. They have started contract negotiations in earnest, but it's not where it needs to be. Not enough progress. As of yet, he has that OTAs, which is a good sign, so he's working out with the team. This could be a path of least resistance because they wanted to see him healthy. He played a full 17 games, 4,600-plus yards. So I suspect this will get done sometime this summer, but it's been a little bit of a slow ride on the contract front. So one to keep an eye on there. Trevor Lawrence, too, Jacksonville. This one has made some progress, I'm told, that this is expected to get done. Not imminent or anything, but they've been talking, and both sides are in a good place. Even though he's had a lot of turnovers in the last year, they're not holding that against him because he really toughed out the second half yeah. of the whole season. He was really beat up, crushed, I was told, and he fought through it to play. So he's the franchise cornerstone. This will probably come in somewhere above $50 million. Mm -hmm. Speaking of $50 million plus, Dak Prescott will definitely get that if this gets done with Dallas because he's got a $61 million cap hit Woo. that they have to somehow massage. I checked with the team source. I was told that they still want to get Dak Prescott done. They have expressed directly to Prescott their desire to get something done. It just the contract process has been slow because it has to be such a big number. They have to come correct when they do. So they're interesting. Very, I expect it to heat up this summer. Yeah. CeeDee Lamb, couple things in play here. He could be waiting on Prescott. Dallas might need to prioritize the quarterback first. And also, CeeDee Lamb appears to be waiting on Justin Jefferson. Really, the whole league is waiting on him to get done. He could be the highest paid non-quarterback in the league when it's all said and done from Minnesota. So, if he's making $34 million a year, you're CeeDee Lamb. You don't want to jump out yet. You want to wait for him to do that and then circle back with Dallas. So, Lamb, Prescott, big priorities for Dallas. San Francisco with Brandon Ayuk. They have been talking. They've been negotiating. Nothing imminent as of yet, but there's certainly a chance. I was told the benchmark here is Amon Ross St. Brown because he got $28 million a year on a four-year deal from Detroit. The goal, is, it appears, is for Ayuk to try to beat that. So he doesn't need to be the highest paid in the league, but he's done enough and has accomplished enough in that offense where he's going to probably need to be at that number or higher. Okay, we're getting back to the 49ers, but just quickly on Justin Jefferson, no progress really there yet because that is kind of what everybody's waiting on, They're, at least yeah. C.D. Lamb. Uh, I would say they've been talking hard progress to where it's imminent. No, it doesn't appear to yeah. be there yet. But both sides want to get it done. They're trying to shake it out. Yeah, and they should, right? they got a rookie quarterback who needs him. Let's continue with the 49ers, though. They ran into the buzzsaw that is the Kansas City Chiefs once again, halting their Super Bowl dreams. Will there be a Super Bowl hangover? Well, this is a Niners team under Kyle Shanahan that's accustomed to being right in the thick of it late in the playoffs. Here's veteran Fred Warner on losing the championship. I'm not even over the first one, so I'm sure this last one, it was, what, like three months ago, uh, I'm still not over it. it. Those things stay with you. Uh, you know, in this league, you are, you earn scars throughout this throughout the league. You know, you face adversity, you know, losing a Super Bowl, of course, is as big as, as big of an adversity uh, that you can hit, and it stays with you, and it makes you stronger. It makes you better. Um, I know I'll be better from it. You know, I've watched it several times and, and seen different plays that we could have made to win that game. And you just got to be better for next time. You know, it's not a matter of if in my mind, it's a matter of when, when we do go in one. Hey, Warner is the leader of the 49ers defense, which has undergone significant change this offseason, especially along the defensive line, as you see here. There were changes to the coaching staff, too, as San Francisco fired former defensive coordinator Steve Wilkes and replaced him with Nick Sorensen, who was their defensive passing game specialist last season. The 49ers also hired former Chargers head coach Brandon Staley, who will have a significant role in coaching their defense. Pretty interesting there. I mean, a lot of changes to this defense. What do you think they need to focus on most this offseason? Season. Well, we should start by saying this was still a very good defense yeah. last year. Actually, really good in the Super Bowl, so they finished really strong. Uh, it wasn't a problem at the end. But there were some cracks throughout the season and in the early part of the postseason. Uh, starting with the run defense, they were much better against the pass than the run, so maybe it's telling that their pass game specialist got elevated to defensive coordinator, particularly between the tackles. As you alluded to, a couple of those defensive tackles are gone, Eric Armstead probably being the most notable departure. Laura, to me, watching them struggle against the run, it wasn't about structure or scheme so much as it was simple execution, Mixed, missed tackles, not fitting the run properly. So that's going to be uh, paramount for the coaching staff. And then the other thing, the one weakness they did have in pass defense 
was cornerback opposite Traverius Ward, who was mm. spectacular. And B. Thomas uh, was someone that offenses like to pick on. So they go out, they draft Renardo Green, and unless he can play at a pretty high level early on, offenses are going to go after him, I suspect, because they don't want to throw at Traverius Ward. So that's going to be a challenge for them early on is protecting him. So the thing you need to understand about the 49ers and their standards is that they were the number one scoring defense in the NFL in 2022. They dropped to third in 2023, and somebody gets fired, yeah. and that somebody is Steve Wilkes. So that's the standard there. If you're third, you're not good enough. They were also, <laughs> most importantly, number one in the NFL in forcing interceptions. They're going to continue to do that because of their identity, because they're going to be able to disguise more. Brandon Staley is going to help with that. He's talked about the flexibility of the defense yesterday during his first comments, just talking about how much they're going to be able to do. We don't know his exact role, but he's not going to be the D.C., but he's certainly going to have some input. I love this quote from Leonard Floyd earlier this month. He signed there two years, $20 million. He said, "When we're so physical that when you play the 49ers, you have to wake up early and eat breakfast. And I think that's their identity. They want to be a hard-hitting team. They're not going to lose that. They understand what this is all about. I think they have a great year with their new staff. Yeah, the addition of Brandon Staley is fascinating to me because he's known yeah. as a creative defensive yep. mind. He'll bring some new ideas that they'll probably try to infuse. He doesn't mind giving up some yards in order to eliminate those big plays and the scoring. So watch for that. And then I found it interesting that Nick Bosa has been at OTA setting a tone. He hasn't always showed up for those. Sometimes yeah. he waits till minicamp. This is a guy who didn't always play to his standard last year and has admitted so. Javon Hargrave, new addition to the defensive line, didn't quite play to the standard he wanted. This is probably still the best defensive line in football, and they're eager to show it, and they're proving that now.